Uh, I wanted to uh, continue our uh, discussion, uh, the, which is kind of the last topic we are looking at in this course. Uh, and uh, this is, um, that I, I mentioned a couple of times before that this is a relatively new uh, uh, finding in the last uh, couple of decades, really. Uh, and uh, it's a reasonably strong effect in uh, electron uh, transport and uh, um, it kind of forced uh, us to learn some uh, some degree of new mathematics that was uh, not uh, realized before uh, and, and and that's one of the reasons why I'm covering it and I think it will assume increasing importance uh, in the future uh, so um, we have in this course discussed quite a bit about uh, uh, things that are well understood, uh, whereas this topic uh, is very much an evolving subject at this point of time. So it's an ample opportunity for young people to make contributions to this area as well, you know, because it's a uh, relatively open field, you know, right now. Okay, so, uh, so uh, we are talking about the. Uh, we just about started talking about what we were calling this anomalous velocity. Uh, and we are connecting it uh, currently uh, to the Berry phase, uh, which is uh, um, uh, we discussed in the last class, and I'll discuss in great detail today with some examples. Uh, it is a gauge invariant uh, uh, phase uh, that occurs in quantum mechanics, and was surprisingly missed by uh, for about you know half a century after the discovery of quantum mechanics, and now uh, it is being related to. Uh, not just transport, but uh, quite a few pr intrinsic properties of uh, crystals, uh, such as uh, electronic polarization, magnetization, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, very intrinsic properties are finally being understood as a consequence of this uh, geometric phase or the uh, uh, topological phase or geometric phase uh, uh, that 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 we are discussing at this point. So uh, we are doing uh, we are discussing Berry phase. Uh, Initially, we are uh, discussing a discrete version of it because that, I think, uh, uh, really uh, illustrates uh, what exactly uh, this thing is. And then, uh, um, uh, and then we'll uh, move over to uh, uh, then we'll move over to. Uh, the continuous version of it, which uh, uh, shows up in the Schrodinger equation and uh, changes, uh, 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 rather, you know, it's not a very big drastic change, but it's a, what looks like a subtle change, but once you apply it to crystals, it has very perceivable effects, you know. Yeah, and and, and uh, so we look at the continuous version of it. <coughs> Berry phase in. Uh, in quantum mechanics, uh, and uh, uh, after that, so we'll we'll first uh, kind of derive what we need to do. Uh, what, you know, for example, uh, we had uh, looked at, uh, you know, without this Berry phase, this was a group velocity. We'll kind of outline how this term comes about, and uh, what is physically this quantity, this curvature, <coughs> or the Berry curvature, and. Uh, uh, now, based on that, what we wanted to do then was uh, uh, immediately we'll be able to explain uh, from some geometric properties or topological properties of the Berry phase why uh, we have this parts per billion precision in the quantum Hall effect. We have, that's, that's our motivation. That's where we started. You know? We wanted to understand the quantum Hall effect and then uh, that will immediately explain uh, why uh, we have the precision uh, in the uh, transverse con conductance. Um, you know, the, uh, in sigma x y is you know some integer times uh, e squared by h. Right, that's something we had seen. Right, and we are saying why is it so precisely quantized? We'll uh, realize that uh, a concept that will emerge from uh, the continuous Berry phase, some of his geometric properties, which is precisely, uh, in, in mathematics, it's called the churn number. And uh, uh, and, and uh, this integer will be uh, the churn number of the Berry phase. And, and we'll see 
uh, I mean, that's, that's one of the main reasons why uh, you have such preci precision in the uh, quantization. Essentially, uh, that number cannot be anything other than integers. You know? and, and, and so whenever your bands and the Fermi level of a system find themselves in a situation where uh, they, you know, the uh, um, Fermi level is between two bands, we'll see that this is an inevitable result. Uh, you know, and, and that's the re reason for the precision. That's our current understanding at this point of time. Why is it uh, so incredibly, you know, precise? And uh, even though, you know, you measure quantum Hall effect in systems that may, uh, may, 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 may have various degrees of disorder in different elements, different semiconductors or graphene, it still shows up as the same number, you know, so. Uh, okay, so uh, we'll also make a connection to, um, uh, what's uh, uh, called the Gauss-Bonnet theorem, uh, which is uh, just mathematical, but we'll see that it, it's another version of this uh, picture. Uh, uh, and again, I mean, there's a connection between these, these things uh, and, and the aspect, or how is it related to transport, we'll kind of talk about a little bit about that. And uh, this is very much in line with the uh, problems in the uh, current in the, in the last assignment I've, I've asked you to do. So you'll see that uh, some of the topics that I cover, I might partially cover the you know, solutions to the assignments as well. But uh, you know, I, uh, I hope you can work together as, as we discuss these topics uh, and, and not delay this because uh, uh, I think we're kind of nearing the end of the semester now, right? So, uh, okay, so uh, you know, the, the assignment here, I've asked you to kind of work along and uh, you will see that uh, whatever we discuss in the class we'll you know you know these these uh, we'll discuss this in, in pretty much in, in this order so we talked about uh, I've asked you to look at what is the Berry phase then what is the Berry flux both its discrete version okay and and its continuous version uh, so so and and the continuous versions look as differential and in integrals whereas the discrete versions look just like sums, right? Sums and, uh, you know, uh, uh, products and, and such. Uh, and as we, uh, let me get my uh, pointer. Uh, and then uh, right after we are comfortable with the uh, concept uh, of it, uh, we will evaluate it for a few examples like, uh, you know, graphene. And uh, uh, that's actually going to be the last topic here. N not last as much as uh, we'll look at it. Uh, so for graphene, uh, we look at the integer quantum Hall effect here, and then uh, look at a few examples. We look at graphene, and uh, another topic I have asked you also in the assignments is something called the anomalous Hall effect. Uh, so there's the quantum Hall effect, and then the anomalous Hall effect. These are the two uh, things we are. I hope to cover today because once the concept is okay, uh, you are comfortable with the concept, you can apply it to many cases. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, just give me a second. Let me just switch this off. <laughs> All right. Um, and, and, and the last question I've asked you, uh, we will, I don't know whether we'll get started on it today, but uh, we have the class on Thursday that's reserved for the class on Thursday. So the, uh, in fact, we will partially solve it today as well because uh, we will encounter this sort of an Hamiltonian for graphene and you know find this very phase etc so okay uh, the other thing is uh, you have gotten that email I have posted uh, two uh, you know uh, um, on, on the class website right I have posted uh, this link and this link you can uh, uh, Look at those. Uh, so, so for example, uh, for the, uh, I hope everybody is able to download this PDF file uh, for this book. It's actually kind of a very nice introductory book to these concepts. And uh, on the Cornell Library site, you should be able to download it at the free PDF file. And the second is a review article. Uh, uh, it's uh, very well written, but I, I think in, initially it's a little dense. It assumes you know a lot of these things, but uh, uh, for once you read uh, chapter two and maybe chapter one of this book, uh, it, it should be, this article should be relatively easy to, you know, get into, but uh, it goes into great details of how a lot of physical phenomena, uh, which uh, was 
there was a lot of confusion before, you know, uh, you know around 2000, year 2000 about many of these concepts, but the single underlying principle of uh, geometric and topological phases really seems to, you know, clear the air in ma many aspects of condensed matter transport and electronic properties, etc. So, so, you know, this article uh, highlights everything that was known till 2010. A lot has changed since then because it's a fast-moving field. You know, so, yeah, okay, so. So please, re, uh, you know, uh, if you get a chance to read, at least uh, definitely read chapter two and one from here. And based on how much time you have, you can make some inroads into this uh, paper as well. Uh, some of the assignment problems, in fact, you will see. I've asked you to refer to a section of this paper because you will see, uh, you know, some some of the solutions. Yeah, there's a question. Uh, I'm yeah. not sure if you were, but some of the solutions links. The solutions oh yes, yes. Uh, I'll have something to say about the solutions, etc. cetera, uh, right after the class today. Okay, so, yeah. uh, okay. so let's, uh, uh, you know, uh, continue the discussion here. Uh, um, so let me just uh, connect this. Okay, good. So uh, the first part of the discussion, I'm uh, following very closely the, um, the uh, chapter two of this book that I've you know, linked for you, right? So, so please uh, uh, get, if, you know, if you can download and read that, that would be most useful. Uh, and so we are, we are actually uh, at this point uh, trying to look at what's called the discrete version of the Berry, Berry phase and the Berry curvature Etc. So, so right. So so all, all all properties, but in the discrete version first, and you know essentially trying to motivate where does this term come from. Uh, okay. So uh, let's actually uh, if if you, if you actually go back and uh, just uh, recounting something we did in the last class is. Uh, uh, we, we, we talked that uh, in, in, uh, you know, in, in, in quantum mechanics, uh, we <coughs> represent uh, the state of any system, be it an electron uh, moving through a crystal or free electron by, by its wave function, right, psi. And uh, we can think of it as a ve vector in the Hilbert space. And we were uh, asking that, uh, look, uh, if uh, I have a, you know, uh, the psi of uh, electron, let's say in a crystal or in any in any situation, it acts, uh, you know, Hamiltonian acts on it, and it gives me the eigenvalues times that function. And that that's all fine. Uh, uh, now, <coughs> uh, one of the things about quantum is, uh, qu you know, of these quantum states is you can multiply this by some arbitrary phase factor, and and it doesn't change the state of the system, right? If it is just a single quantum state, but now if I make a slight uh, uh, change to this problem and say that uh, uh, you know the, the state of the system, the vector is pointing, let's say, in, in some direction like that, and there's some parameter in the Hamiltonian that I start varying, and the wave, this depends on that parameter, you know, the state. For example, this can be the wave vector k the k of a, you know, uh, or it could be a magnetic field or something like that. I start varying a parameter. And now this uh, vector, as I go from one parameter to another parameter, let's just call it in general a parameter, uh, maybe it starts, you know, the vector starts moving a little bit, right? So rotating a little bit. And so now it's here it's psi 1, here it's psi 2, here it's psi 3, and so on. So what we discussed in the last class was uh, if I uh, find, uh, you know, from, from some parameter point lambda 1 to some other parameter point lambda 2, I look at this vector, how is it moving? And uh, I ask, what is the total phase change in going from here to there right, of that vector? Uh, and there will be some phase change, uh, except uh, what we said that this phase change is not gauge invariant, if you remember what we discussed. Gauge meaning, what is a gauge? Gauge means uh, I'm going to take this point, that point, I'm going to change this by some arbitrary angle, I'm going to change that by some arbitrary angle, and you know, make it point in different directions. And, and so that, that's a gauge, meaning some arbitrary angle as a function of lambda, and then I multiply each of these wave functions by this phase. 
and this is arbitrary, remember, you can choose anything you want, right? This is an arbitrary function. In which case, uh, we realize that uh, you know, if I go from here all the way to there, uh, and I'm randomly changing the phases at all points, then the total phase that you accumulate from here to there depends on these factors. It depends on these factors. So this is what you call it's gauge. It depends on the gauge. It's this, you know, the state is not gauge invariant. But uh, what is very remarkable is if you close this path, right? If you if you kind of come back to where you started, right? That's a closed path. Right? In, 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 in that case, what happens is the total phase that you accumulate, you know, if you, let's say you start from state psi 1, you go to psi 2. That's the angle of the first step, first hop, right? Psi 3, this is the, remember this is the angle because uh, you, you, uh, you know, the difference in angles between these two is, is the you know, inner product. It's like a cosine theta, inner product, right? e to the power i. So this gives you effectively e to the power i you know, the angle between, you know, gamma 2 minus gamma 1, let's say, right? So the angle between. And, and then this gives you e to the power, you know, so similarly something i gamma 2, 3. You can write it as 1, 2, 2, 3, and so on, right? You start accumulating. And uh, what we're saying is if I close the path, let's say I go to step n, and then I come back to 1, right? Close, close the path. Then uh, I have uh, a phase e to the power i, you know, gamma n to 1. And this total, you know, f uh, if I write the, uh, this whole thing as e to the power i, a total gamma, you know, total phase that is accumulated because of the product of all these things. And uh, what we find, what Barry also uh, realized, that, that this whole thing is actually gauge invariant because you can see that I can twist this by e to the power i, you know, alpha 2, let's say, right? I can twist that e to the power minus i alpha 2. Do you see that? I mean, this one will give you a minus, this will give you a plus. The, the, all these individual gauge changes you have introduced cancel out in the end. And so what you end up with is a phase here that depends on, definitely depends on the closed path, but it doesn't depend on what gauges you choose anymore. Right? So it's a gauge invariant quantity, and this is what's called the very phase, you know. Of, of any quantum system, of any wave function. And I'll talk very briefly later that it's also true for classical systems, especially, especially light, you know, which has two polarizations. You know. uh, so the way uh, this phase is written uh, is instead of writing e to the power i, uh, you write gamma is, you know, it, this is written as an argument of this whole thing, right? And I think argument you understand uh, in, in, in um, complex numbers, the argument, if you write it as z, e to the power i theta, right? Then the argu this is what's called the argument, right? So if you write argument of a complex number, it is basically theta. But you have a choice because theta can be 0, it can be 180, it can be 720, right? You take it between, you know, 0 to 2 pi or minus pi to pi. You take it between. So that's the, you know, that's the rule we follow about the argument here, okay? Okay, so so uh, so that that's the definition now of a Berry phase. Uh, at least, uh, is there any question here? Because uh, does it intuitively make sense that you, you actually, you know, for any closed path, you get a you, uh, you get a gauge independent phase, uh, and if it's uh, independent of uh, invariant with the gauge, that uh, the the uh, you know, from most physical laws, you un understand that there, it must have some physical manifestation, and you know that's really what we are after. And uh, uh, so, the and sometimes in books it has a minus sign. It doesn't really matter. You can choose whichever you want, right? So, so that's your Berry phase. The big L here is for a closed loop. If, you, if your loop is closed. You know. Now, uh, based on the phase, uh, you can immediately uh, define another quantity. Uh, let's say I have an area of instead of a line of this parameter space, instead of a line, I have an area, okay? two dimensions, or you know, surface of a three dimension, or something like that. Okay? Uh, in fact, uh, uh, okay, so let's, let's talk about uh, an area instead of a line, uh, and, and then uh, uh, we can define another quantity. Uh, so by the way, this phase, 
really depends on which path you choose. Right? I mean, if I choose uh, uh, a closed path, you know, I, you know, I'm just sketching this at this point. You know, something <coughs> like that compared to something that is very different, then the phase will change. <coughs> but what you're guaranteed is that you know the wave fun the the phase is not going to depend upon what what you know twisting you uh, you know what 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 uh, gauge choices you have, but the phase itself will change. So, okay. And it's very important to uh, also uh, connect that if you have an open path, then everything is up for grabs, meaning there is no this is not gauge invariant. But the, uh, this is true only when you close the path. You know, it's for a closed path. Okay. So. okay. <coughs> Now, uh, closely associated with the Berry phase of, uh, 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 of a quantum system, as we are discussing here, is, is, uh, is what's called the Berry flux. And uh, let's say I you know, uh, have chosen, this is a two-dimensional plane, and I've chosen a path that looks like that. I can actually break it up into smaller sections of it. Okay. Can break it up into small sections of this, and ask what is the phase, Berry phase, if I go from here to there, here to there, here to there, and come back. That's a closed path, right? So I can find what's the Berry phase for a path like that, right? right? And and that quantity is, is what's called the Berry flux. Okay, so so we'll you know uh, Berry flux, inst uh, unlike the phase is more of a vectorial quantity. Actually, it's a tensor quantity, but regardless, it has a direction in, in, in a sense of which direction do you go around the loop. Okay? You know, right-hand rule, you can apply the right-hand rule, for example, or you know, either into the board or outside the board. And, and in addition, what you are doing here is, let's say, uh, instead of this you know, strange looking path, I had a, I had a more, uh, just for argument's sake, a rectangular path here where I'm going from site 1 comma 1 to a site n comma m. You know? so, so that's all, it's a discrete grid of points, right? So, so we can write it like that. And so now uh, you can define for each one of these uh, discrete grid, point, uh, grid you know, squares or rectangles uh, uh, an effective Berry flux, which uh, let's call this as n comma m, right? And then we can define the Berry flux associated uh, with n comma m as the sum of the Berry phases, this way plus that way plus that way plus that way. Right? Does that make sense? I mean, that's essentially it's the Berry phase of going around that loop. That's what the Berry flux, except it has some orientation too now. So, so that's. Uh, uh, I don't want to kind of write that down, except you can, well, OK, I can write it as n Berry phase going from n to, let's say, n plus 1. Now, that's your x direction, and that's your y direction. Okay. You go from here to n plus 1, sorry, n plus 1 comma m, right? So you go from here to there, same m but different n. Then you go up. Plus 1, m plus 1 gamma n plus, uh, sorry, uh, go up there. Then you go back, m plus 1 plus gamma n comma. Wait, so this is n plus 1, n plus 1. <laughs> n plus 1, m plus 1, then you get back to n comma m plus 1, and you get back to n. Right. Uh, is that correct, what I wrote? No. And so there are four points here. This one is what? n comma m plus 1. Okay, so I should write it a slightly different. I should write it uh, with the index of the path, right? N m to n plus 1 comma m. Does that make sense? I'm just, I, I think that's why I was messing this up. OK, so this plus the path n plus 1 comma m to n plus 1 m plus 1 plus n 
All right, so there's a good reason I was not trying to write it, but yeah. Uh, gamma n m plus one back to n comma m, right? So, so this is your total flux, uh, which is the sum of the phases accumulated in each of the four paths here. Um, what space is this? So this is what's called the parameter space. So your Hamiltonian depends on some parameter. And for us, most of the time, this will depend on the k, ek diagram, the wave vector, you know, the uh, crystal momentum space. But it could be other things. It could be magnetic fields. It could be various, various other things. For us, it will primarily be the k space. You know. And we'll look into that. This definition is independent of what parameter you choose. You know, it's always true. Uh, and uh, there are, um, yeah, so. By K, you mean the KX and KY. KX, KYs, that's correct. So for example, this one could be KX and that could be KY, for example. And we'll look at that for graphene today you know, and, and for uh, electron motion in crystals. So we'll always be in like, the space of the quantum yeah, so this would be a discrete, we are going to you know, move this over to continuous case right away, but yes, this could be your kx, 2 pi by l you know, times n, n plus 1 and all that, for example, absolutely, yeah. So uh, now, uh, so this is the, what we're defining now as, 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 as a Berry flux, and instead of writing gamma now, we are going to use the you know, term f for flux, and that's, uh, 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 you know, here's, here's kind of the definition of the Berry flux. Now, that's the angle, right? These are the angles, but the way we define it is really because it is related to the uh, phase, uh, those numbers need not be equal, but the phase e to the power i theta should be the same. That's how you define the Berry flux, Berry phase, all of them, you know, just like here. So, so, you know, this is how the Berry flux is related to the closed loop, uh, uh, for the closed loop, uh, you know, uh, accumulation of the Berry phase ac uh, around any closed loop, yeah? So right as F n comma M, but it's packed, right? So if we went, say, to the left and then up and then to get back, then we should get yeah. a different F. Yeah, so you can choose a path. So either, let's say, clockwise here or, or counterclockwise here. Uh, but what I'm saying is, for example, this flux clearly is related to this rectangle, right? so which is why we have a label like this. And then the total you know, amplitude of the Berry phase around it is what we get here as the amplitude. But the direction you know, is not apparent in this picture, but it has a direction too, based on which direction you're going. You know. uh, maybe the right hand circle, uh, right hand rule, for example. Okay? So that's your Berry flux, right? And uh, one of the very interesting things you notice right away, if you take a flux uh, definition like this, is if I take, you know, uh, not just one, one of these, but I merge two of them, you know, let's say I merge these two, right? Then, uh, and I do the same business again, I go to the right, up, left, and down. Then you see this part fluxes cancel out. One of them is positive, the other. Right? It's very reminiscent of you probably, you know, Stokes theorem and all that stuff you have seen many times. <coughs> and uh, and indeed, uh, so for example, the Berry flux of this, you know, entire area here does not depend on this path now. <laughs> so you can kind of make it bigger and bigger and bigger, and you can see that the total Berry flux will depend on the outer edge. It will not depend on the details of the inside anymore. Right. So, right, so so that's uh, another important quantity of the Berry flux, and there's some very strong anal analogy to Stokes theorem, except it's not the same, because Stokes theorem uh, tells you that uh, so here everything is modulo two pi. You know? This is the major difference. You know, you're not guaranteed to have a unique flux. It will be a phase, for example. It will be modulo two pi, right? Always, and that makes the big difference. Uh, a, a between here and the you know, normal uh, definition. Okay. So now, uh, so one of the most you know, kind of remarkable thing happens, is that clear by the way? I mean, this is very standard definition of something, right? One of the most remarkable thing happens when you look at this sum, uh, you know, the, the total flux. So essentially what we're looking at here then is uh, if I have a closed path, I can kind of choose this and write this whole thing here instead of as a sum 
yeah, well, you can write it as a you know Berry phase. Uh, so we are what we are doing is we are uh, taking the fluxes of each of these rectangles, and I take a product of all of them, right? N comma m. Does that make sense? I'm, I'm in, which means I'm adding the fluxes of each of these areas, right? So that would be equal to the total Berry flux around the you know entire outer loop, around the entire outer closed loop, and. Uh, and, 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 and so I can write this as, instead of writing the product, you can write it as a sum over all n comma m, right? F n comma m. Right? And that's, that's, uh, that's exactly. So again, I'm being a little sloppy with the signs minus or plus. It doesn't, that's what's written here. And uh, so how are these two related then? So you can think of it now as this phase uh, you know, if you try to draw the analogy with Stokes' theorem, uh, you know, this phase, uh, you are integrate, you know, this phase is a sum. Let me write it first in the discrete version. It's a sum around an uh, outer loop, right? Of, of phase factors, you know, gamma n to m to n plus 1, comma, you know, m and so on, right? The outer loop, for example. And on the right side, so that's your uh, the total phase here. On the right side, what you have here is a, a sum over areas. You know, this is the flux and m over an area here. Does that make sense? This is, you know, and it's related to the area. It has a direction to. And then uh, in, in the continuous form, this will become an integral over a closed loop okay. along a path, you know, whatever path you choose, times, uh, and we are going to label this later, uh, what, what we'll call is a, as, as the, you know, Berry connection or Berry vector potential, if you might. And this will become equal to, this will be an area integral, okay, in, in that parameter space times you know, and this quantity here, what we are going to integrate is, is, is you know, we're going to call it the Berry curvature, or uh, I think in the, no, in, in the book, uh, it's, it's using this, or we can call it, you know, uh, this, uh, this Berry curvature. It will become this. So essentially, what, what we are doing here is if we take any closed loop, you know, this loop integral around this, of, of this quantity going around this will become equal to the, you know, integral of this curvature term inside the surface. You know, if you uh, take patches and all that. Except, uh, this is Stokes' theorem, really. You know, it's exa this is exactly what Stokes' theorem is. For example, this can be your uh, vector po magnetic vector potential. This can be your magnetic field in real space. You know. we, except here, you are not guaranteed this. You, you are always have a 2 pi times an integer. Because these are phases, remember. It's not, it's not you know, a physical. Uh, it's not in the, you know, uh, they are not related directly but through phases. So, so they always, uh, that's the major difference between Stokes' theorem and this. Yeah. So can you relate um, the curvature to the connection uh, by using Stokes' theorem, or is, is it the 2 pi n balances it up? Uh, 2 pi n is always around. So what is it? So in terms of a curl, so you could do, um, like if you apply Stokes' theorem. Yeah, if I apply the cur uh, Stokes' theorem now, we will get that the, this is related to that, because you take a curl or you take a derivative of the two, and, and that, that becomes directly related to, in fact, this is an exact relation. Uh, you know, in your notes and also in the book, they have used, uh, just to be clear, you know, they use this, uh, you know, uh, calligraphic B, but in the k space, you know, it's always in the k space, okay? And very curvature is about the same. So, uh, you know, in the, uh, this is a vector, you can write it as curl of the Berry vector potential. That's always true, you know, uh, meaning there the 2 pi goes away. Uh, yeah. Okay, so that's all, yeah. Uh, is the flux the sum of all that, or like, is the exponential part of the flux? Ah, yeah. So the flux is uh, defined, for example, for each of these. You know, you can call it a square, or sometimes in, if you read papers, they'll call it a plaquette. You know, this is called a plaquette. So F11 is associated with just this region. You know. Okay. And so and, and it's it's related to this area, if you might, yeah. in in the in the parameter in the case space, if you might. And then uh, it only relates to this F12. 
sorry, F21 would relate to that one, okay. and so on. And now what we are doing is we are taking this flux plus that flux plus that flux. Okay. We're summing, but inside the exponential, you know, okay. not okay. direct sum. You know. Okay. Okay. So meaning you're doing the direct sum, but it's the e to the power i times that. You know. I guess so. Like yeah. f is the flux, not e to the negative i. No, that's correct. Okay. F is the flux. Okay. E to the power i stuff is the phase that will appear in the Schrodinger equation okay. in the evolution, right? right. Yeah. Uh, flux is very standard. I mean, there's yeah, no yeah, confusion yeah, yeah. about that. Yeah. Okay. So uh, uh, that's all. All you know. Uh, one. I think I in principle, the one new thing we have encountered is there is such a gaze. You know, there's a phase which is independent of of uh, any gauges you choose. So, so that's. But now the second very you know remarkable thing happens is, is if I take this path, and instead of being an open path like this, uh, open area like this. I put it on a closed area. You know. Closed area now, right? So uh, what's a closed area? For example, I've you know, tried to, uh, this is from your assignment, really. Here's an example of a closed area. And here we're making a connection now to uh, you know, electron transport. Okay? So let's say I take a two-dimensional electron gas as an example, which is where quantum Hall effect is seen. You know? the electrons uh, are in a 2D electron gas. <coughs> And here's your kx allowed for the electrons. This is the ky allowed for electrons now. Right? And you go to the k space, and I form my discrete grid here. Now, right? And uh, uh, now, uh, uh, what, one of the interesting things about uh, the, so this is uh, my brilliant zone, you know, pi by a to minus pi by a in x, and you know, minus pi by a to pi by a in y as well. Right? And one of the interesting things about the brillouin zone is you know, all these points, which are labeled by red here at pi by a on the right side, are actually exactly the same as the ones on the left side. They are the same points, actually. They are, you know, for convenience, they are sketched uh, in a planar form. But they are periodic. You know, all properties, the wave function, all of them are periodic, meaning whatever is the wave function of this state here, kx, ky, is equal to the wave function of that kx, ky. Exactly the same, right? What does that mean? It means I can take this red line here and I can wrap it around and put it on top <coughs> of this, and it's really a cylinder now, right? Uh, from that perspective, and then the same thing here, the blue line, you can wrap it around, put it on that. So now that becomes a torus. It's obviously not to scale. You know, it looks a lot more along that direction, but you become a torus now. Right? Does that make sense? So your k-space in uh, which is Consider which is our parameter here, for example, uh, is become a torus now, and all your wave functions, your eigenvectors of electrons in this, you know, 2D electron gas, you can imagine them as point, you know, vectors associated with each of these discrete points now, right? As you move along on top of a torus now, uh, right? And so now, if you put it on top of a closed surface, you, I can break it. You know, if you look at all these grid, grid you know, uh, points, and I, I start evaluating my total very flux around this entire surface. Okay? So what I want to do is e to the power i. I'm going to sum over n comma m all my fluxes here. Okay. Right. So maybe you can tell me by looking at that, what will it be? If I sum all the fluxes around any surface, right? Remember, what is the flux? The flux is phase this plus that plus that plus that for each point, right? Then you go to the next one, you get this, 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 and you see, oh, that one cancels, right? You go that one, that one cancels, and you can see that on a closed surface, everything will cancel, right? There's no other option on a closed surface. They all must cancel, exactly, because, you know, each line here is shared between you know, multi, uh, two, two patches of area, and they have opposite orientations. One is go if one, you're going clockwise in one direction, you're going anti-clockwise in the other. So they must all cancel. Is that clear, by the way? The total flux, according to this, you know, the way we have defined it here, when I sum them all, it will actually be, become equal to 0, e to the power i times 0. Uh, is that clear? Because the, this is very important quantity now, right? So uh, on any closed surface, uh, there are actually some other, ma to make it mathematically more ri rigorous, there's some orientable surface and that sort of thing, because there are surfaces which, like Mobius strips and others, which are slightly different. We are looking at, you know, a torus is very standard, or a sphere, or a you know, pretzel, whatever you are, meaning, meaning things that are closed surfaces. 
the total sum of the berry flux is much vanish. And just because, you know, it's a closed surface, that's all there is to it. Right? Make sense? Uh, and, and the reason for that is uh, just uh, that, you know, along any path you are going twice, one in one direction and the other in the opposite direction. So the total flux becomes zero. As a result, on a closed surface, uh, this quantity is actually exactly equal to one. Right? right? E to the power i times the Berry phase becomes equal to exactly equal to one, right? Okay. So, so because the sum uh, of the total curve, which is equal to uh, total flux, is equal to one, uh, so the Berry phase, therefore, the uh, uh, so you can see that, uh, that 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 immediately implies that this thing must be e to the power i two pi times and some integer, right? It, you are not guaranteed to get you know the Berry phase need not be zero. For any path you choose on, on, on the closed surface, the, 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 it, it is e, e to the power i 2 pi times an integer. That's, that's all you can guarantee. Right? You cannot guarantee anything else. Now, that integer, whatever sits here, is what's called the churn number. And it also has a very physical meaning. Okay? And that integer is what's called the churn number now. And I'll sh just discuss what, what is its physical. <coughs> so let's say you take, you know, these are your vectors, and you're going around, right? And it's kind of a very smooth. Uh, vector orientation, meaning as I go around this whole thing, th all these are maybe uh, you know aligned maybe 45 degrees or 30, 30 degrees or something like that, and there's no kind of uh, big change anywhere in this picture, right? In that case, uh, uh, you know the that case. Uh, let me just say, so this is my vector, if you might, uh, Hilbert's you know uh, eigenvector. If you go around and no big changes, this is very different from if I have something like this. You are, you are going around, and suddenly the vectors have a twirl, and there's a vortex here, you know, where the you know uh, wave functions have a um, uh, you know go around a vortex at, around this point here, for example, right? Does that make sense? I mean, so this is very different from this. What Berry phase tells you, or rather, what this relation tells you is, for both of them, your total you know e to the power i gamma l is still equal to one. But what is different about the two is this q, which is the churn number. You know. The churn number mathematically counts how many such vortices are there on this surface, on the torus, for example, here, or for any closed surface. How many vortices occur on the surface is counted by the churn number. You know? okay. And how is it counted? That's also actually rather straightforward if you look at the discrete uh, picture. So the way uh, we are defining this uh, flux is always, you know, we are saying, you know, for example, here, Let's say this is 45, 45, 45, 45, and then you're going around this loop, and uh, you know, or, or, or 30 degrees, or 30 degrees, and all that. So if you sum, uh, you know, from here to here, there's no change. Here to here, there's no change. Here to here, there's no change at all, right? So the Berry phase for for this picture, the churn number would be if if all the vectors were like that, it would be actually zero, right? Total churn number, no vortices. But if I go around here, you can see that this angle compared to that angle is a very large angle around a vortex, for example, right? And it easily, if I sum all these four angles, I exceed <coughs> 2 pi. <coughs> Do you see that? I mean, for this example, I exceed 2 pi. Right? Now, if I take that quantity, how much do I exceed this thing by 2 pi, right? And I divide it by 2 pi, I can count. I mean, that's, that's, the me that's actually the meaning of the churn number. Right? Churn number is how much excess do you have? How, mu how much do these wave functions twirl around, around vortices? You know how much more than two pi are they? Right? So that's that's the meaning of this this, this quantity churn number. Meaning, if you take instead of taking the value between zero and two pi or minus pi and pi, you take its full value first, right? And then you find out how much farther away from two pi did you go, right? And that's the meaning of the churn number here. You know, it's the sum of all these angles without taking any of the, you know, without making it fall back to zero and two pi, and then finding how much excess do you have over the 2 pi here. So that's the physical meaning of it. And by the way, the churn number is a sum of all the vortices around the surface, not just one area, all of them. Okay. Yeah? So I'm a little confused about how we said the sum of all the fluxes is zero there, and that it seems to be non-zero here when we're calculating the churn number. Like I get why it's zero there, if that makes sense. Yes, yes. 
Uh, yeah, that's a good, it's a good point. Okay, so the way uh, maybe uh, look at uh, I think this, this should have been written a slightly. So if you choose the so re remember uh, I can uh, when I say you know the total flux ha has added up to zero. When I was calculating that total flux, I was I was always taking the value if I go around the uh, here, here between zero and two pi. You know what I mean? I'm, if I get, say, 3 pi, I'm subtracting out 2 pi and bringing it back to pi. Okay. Let's say I don't do that, right? I, I see how far it went, you know. Uh, that, that's the physical meaning. So maybe in notation, I should put a hat here or something, okay. where I do not take the value in 0 and 2 pi, but I let it go all its way and, and calculate the total angle. Okay. Does this make sense? I mean, yeah. This is the excess, really. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And then that's the meaning of the churn number then. And, uh, and uh, uh, the very interesting fact is this quantity, how many vortices occur on a closed surface, is always an integer. This is, this is, the, remark this is the theorem of churn you know, uh, uh, and uh, related to gauss bonnet theorem, etc. That uh, is mathematically, topologically guaranteed to be an integer. You know, how many vortices occur? There's no such thing as 2.5 vortices. You know, it's exactly 2 or 10 or 0 or whatever. You know, something, it's an integer, exactly an integer. So, uh, so that that's the physical basis, uh, uh, and the churn number is the sum of the very fluxes of all plaquettes of a closed surface is the number of vortices on the surface. So that's the physical meaning of it. Okay. So this is the discrete version of the uh, Berry phase and the churn number. Right? Now, the moment we go into the continuous version, uh, all these things effectively stay the same, except you know, you know, these quantities instead of being sums become integrals. You know, that that that's the major difference now. Yeah. So let's actually do that, and I'll, I'll write down the expressions. But I'll make a few connections of this to uh, uh, one of the very uh, remarkable theorems, also, which is the Gauss-Bonnet theorem. I'll make a connection to that. But perhaps after we go through the derivation of the continuous version, and then apply it to quantum Hall effect, and then we'll do the how is it related to, to uh, uh, you know, what's called the gauss bonnet theorem and what are its consequences? By the way, it, there doesn't have to be one hole. If you take a 3D crystal, now you can see something which can't be sketched, you know, because it's a 3D torus now. And so, meaning if you take kx, ky, and kz, now you have three surfaces. So that shape cannot be pl plotted on a paper, but at least it exists. I mean, wh whether we can plot it or not is our problem, right? But it exists, and mathematically it exists, and it has real physical consequences as well. Yeah. Can you relate a quantity like the churn number to, let's say, the genus? Of uh, the absolutely. Genus? Yes, yes, and we'll talk about that. This is uh, basically the churn number is related to how many holes or handles are there in any closed surface. You know, here there is one hole, for example. A sphere has zero holes, right? If you pretzel as two and so on, so the churn number is related to that as well. So, so we, we're going to talk about that. By the way, uh, there are a few things. So the churn number of this shape itself is related to how many holes there are. But we are talking about not that exactly, as, not, not that uh, as much as the churn number of the wave functions that live on the surface. You know, the wave vector, the vectors that live on the surface. They're slightly different things, but they are also connected. Actually, so yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll make that connection. Okay. So uh, let's now look at the continuous version of the Berry phase, and uh, I'll just make the uh, you know derivation. Uh, and there you start from Schrodinger equation. I don't want to kind of spend too much time because it's written up in the book, and I will outline how you get the Berry phase. But the main results are the following: that uh, the Berry phase in the continuous version uh, will become uh, I times a con closed loop integral of, I'm going to just write it for crystals, just so you know we know it's k, ek diagram, it's the crystal momentum. I'm going to write it in that way. Dot product with uh, <coughs> uh, a gradient of n comma k, oh, sorry, gradient in the k space. Uh, times u n k, and what is this u n? Uh, this u n is the if I write the wave function of the nth band in a crystal okay, uh, at wave vector k at you know any r, you write it as e to the power i you know k dot r. It's a block function, right? Times the you know cell periodic part of it. Okay, 
this is the this is the functional part of a block function for an electron in a crystal that repeats in every unit cell. This is the slowly varying phase modulation part. The part that goes into the Berry phase is this one. And this part is, uh, you know, we, we, it's kind of combined with the crystal Hamiltonian. And that makes the k the parameter that you vary. The parameter that we vary here, k. Uh, you take it kind of to the left side, if you might, in a Schrodinger equation, and you merge it with the uh, with the uh, crystal Hamiltonian. Uh, in other words, let me just write that down. So you know, p squared by two m plus v of r crystal potential wave function is equal to e psi of r. This is the most general form of wave functions of electrons. Now, if this is periodic, then we know that this must follow block function behavior, right? And if, if so, if, this is, if V of R is periodic, what we're saying is we can substitute it here. And you know, your block function essentially gets modified by oh, sorry, H bar times K whole square by 2M plus V of R. So this is a slightly modified version of block function where you're writing it. Does that make sense? Instead of size, you're writing it in terms of the cell periodic part of the block function. And the k has gone in here. Your Hamiltonian now is explicitly dependent on k. Right? And that's, that's, that's what we are varying, the k here. Right? That's our parameter that we are varying. So, does it make sense? So this is your Hamiltonian here in a block function. It becomes a parameter. Uh, and so uh, this is this is the Berry phase in the continuous version. I'm not trying to derive it. Essentially, all, all you know what you are doing here is you are evaluating an integral going from say k1 to k2 to k3, you know k2 to k3, and small changes in k, right? K1 to k2 is the next point, and that becomes dk. These small changes become dk here, okay. and and uh, this this you know, a uh, way the function is related from at one k to the next k is d by dk. You know? so, so essentially, you're integrating this whole thing around a closed loop. And I don't want to derive it. It's done in two or three steps in, in the you know, chapter I mentioned that uh, suggested you to read. Yeah. So this quantity here, i times all that stuff, is what's called the Berry connection or the Berry vector potential, if you might. You know? i times. The wave function or the eigenfunction times the gradient of the eigenfunction is, is called the vector potential. And this is just kind of conveniently written so that you write it as dk dot a vector potential. Right. If you draw the analogy to uh, uh, a real vector potential, this is a vector potential in the k space. It's not in the real space, not in the R space, but in the k space. If you draw an analogy, to an electron that is actually moving in real space in the presence of a magnetic field, okay, a real magnetic field in real space. So let's say here's the B field. Uh, B field comes with a, a B field is a curl of a real space vector potential. Let's call it R just to make sure it's real space. You know? If an electron is going like that, as it goes through here, it actually accumulates a phase. You know, remember your momentum becomes p minus e times a, right? As a result, e to the power i, you know, p x over h bar. This is the phase of an electron in normal, you know, standard uh, quantum mechanics. That becomes e to the power i, still the momentum x over h bar. But then you also get a phase i electron charge over h bar times an integral of a dot dl real space, right, or dr. Does that make sense? This is a phase that you accumulate in real space. This is the phase in Berry phase, in k space. And that's why there's the anal analogy between the vector potential here with the real space vector potential there. And you know, this picture, you can explain things like aha and bohm effect if you go around solenoid you know, interference and all kinds of other things. Can get quantum, I mean, uh, Landau level formation, all that stuff from here as well. Okay, so. Anyway, this is the analogy. So this is why we are calling it A, you know, a vector potential. Okay, now going back, 
just like uh, uh, you know, your magnetic field in real space is curl in real space R of uh, the vector potential in real space, right? Uh, here we are defining now a vector potential in, in, in the K space, okay? And then that will be uh, is uh, I'm just going to write it as curl of this. Uh, now remember, curl makes sense if you are in a certain uh, curl is a general idea, uh, but in 3D we know what it is, right? In uh, if you are in 2D or 4D, you have to be use slightly modified versions of, of, of what we you know traditionally use as d by dx and d by dy and all uh, you know cross product right so yeah but uh, in three in 3d this is this is the idea okay all right so uh, these are the two main results and from here what we are going to be able to remember how it went in so here's the wave function of the electron of a block you know periodic part of the block function if I know that I can find very phase and if I find if I know that I can well, uh, so so this is just I times U and K and K. So so if I know that, I can find both Berry phase and Berry curvature. One is the closed loop integral; the other is a curl. And uh, uh, right, okay, and and then just uh, remember. So the Berry curvature. Because it's a curl, it has no ambiguity of 2 pi n and all that. As I think that was the discussion earlier. It is uniquely defined. And so just like we talked about the mass, the charge of an electron, the spin of an electron, the k of an electron to be fundamental quantities, once we place an electron in a crystal, the Berry curvature is also an intrinsic fundamental quantity of the, of the crystal now. Right? It doesn't depend on uh, what you do from outside. I mean, of course, you can change it from doing external, but it's any, any crystal intrinsically has a Berry curvature associated because it's related to the wave functions of the, of the crystal. Right? So it's, it's an intrinsic property. OK, so uh, l let me uh, write down a few lines here as to how, how one might uh, be able to get, you know, get this uh, relation. So let's say, again, I have a, uh, uh, the picture I wanted to use was uh, you know, this picture where I have a you know, Hamiltonian of any general system, and let's say I have a state n, and that's giving me an eigenvalue n, right? And I come in with a parameter. We just saw the parameter that we are talking about instead of time is k, for example, or whatever you choose. Right? I change changing the k. I start changing the k. As a result, the eigenvalue of e of k starts changing. Maybe it draws the band structure or something like that, or whatever, right? It starts changing. And, uh, and then I have another eigenvalue, another eigenvalue here. And as I start changing this parameter, these you know, energies start moving around uh, depending upon this parameter. Right? Let's call this parameter r and big R. Right? Right? And this is how uh, generally it's written. And, and you can imagine, uh, this is not necessary, but you can imagine that you are changing this parameter in, you know, Time, in real time, for example, or, or in some other magnetic field or something like that, okay? So what we're saying is the energy eigenvalue also becomes a function of that parameter. And we are uh, saying that if I take this, you know, wave function around a closed loop, you know, this is the wave function or the eigenfunction of the system. If I, if I take it around a closed loop, does it come back to itself or is there an extra phase associated with it, you know? And then the Berry phase uh, picture is, there is an extra phase, and that's what we have derived till now. You know, well, we have written down just the results. We didn't derive it rigorously from the quantum mechanics picture. So essentially, to do that, <coughs> we'll have to solve this now right? and say that uh, if I take it around a closed loop, this R of t, if I take it around some sort of a closed loop in parameter space, you know, then when I come back after that loop, is my n t plus some big T, a closed loop, let's say, right? Is that equal to its, uh, what it started with, or is it something different? That's really the question we are after, right? And the uh, answer is it is different by the Berry phase. You know? So that's, that's what we're after. So to solve that, uh, we actually use uh, the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. And I'm, I'm outlining, outlining this. I'm not trying to kind of you know, uh, go through the whole derivation, but I h bar d by dt of any state, right? This is the state we are after, right? 
we are tracking with time is equal to you know its eigenvalue at that point times n of r t. Uh, there are some implicit assumptions in this particular derivation that if I am changing this electron doesn't jump to another level, you know, because it's possible if, if you change too fast, you know, it can jump there. But uh, this is why we call it adiabatic. <coughs> By the way, the physics of it is independent of this assumption. You know, it doesn't depend on it because you can change k too. But uh, you know, there's a f chance that if I change it too fast, the frequency omega times h bar can become of this order, and then the electron is possible to absorb a, f a quantum of that and, and go over there, for example, like a phonon absorption or something like that. We are saying that we are not, you know, we are excluding such possibilities at this point. And, and here, uh, uh, what we are say saying is if I uh, go through a closed loop, uh, are there solutions you know, uh, of, of, of a form that looks something like this? That's, that's what we are really after, right? With a non-zero gamma L, right? And so to find that, what you do is you just substitute this here and there, right? And see whether gamma L is identically zero or is there something you know, for you to deal with. Does that make sense? You just substitute it there. And this is from Barry's paper in 1984. You know, you can just take this and substitute here, and you know, this function, let it also give, the phase also change with time. In fact, it will depend on the path, right? So it must change with time as well. And then you can take, uh, you know, uh, the derivatives of both sides, i h bar d by d t, i gamma l of t times n. This is time dependent, so I'm just going to write it like that, just not to mess up all the details here, uh, is equal to e times e to the power i gamma l times times n. And so what I'm doing really is trying to find out whether this gamma is identically zero or not. Right? That's all I'm trying to do. Right? And, 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 and then when you take the derivative, uh, uh, what you can do is on the right side, you can just take a projection to you know, some other state. Uh, you know. Let's just take it to uh, uh, state n on, on, the, on the right side here, OK? Uh, in which case, uh, there's only one term left, right? And it goes away. And similarly, on the left side also, we take a projection to state n. Okay? And then I have to take a, uh, this n and that n just go away. And you get energy eigenvalue of the nth state times e to the power i gamma l t right, on the right side. And here uh, you have three quantities. You have this and this and this. All three are dependent on time now. Right? So you got to take a product, you know, by parts. This derivative of that derivative of that. Right? So you have three terms. And then this is kind of the key uh, thing here. So you get d by dt of kind of the left bracket here plus you know, d by dt of e to the power i gamma l d uh, times n plus, yeah, gamma l of t times, uh, so it, it, it first this, first that, and then the last one, n times d by dt of n. Uh, it's a little messy to write it this way, but uh, anyway, I'm just going to put it. You get three terms, and uh, you get e n e to the power i gamma l t. So just to be clear, so this this quantity here, you know, when you take the derivative, it will pull out e to the power i gamma to the front, okay, and you get a time derivative of the i gamma. This quantity, uh, right. So e to the power i gamma l can be pulled out. Let me just rewrite it. So uh, you can see that uh, I will get a e to the power i gamma l in all three terms that we cancel with that one. Just, uh, and, and what I'll be left with here is what I'm going to write down. So you can see this quantity appearing already, which is very similar to the relation I wrote for the very phase here. It's very similar to that. Right? You know, wave function, the derivative, and then the wave function itself again. Right? So, so it's, a, it's a very similar relation. And, and uh, because of this, uh, what I get is, uh, uh, let me just, uh, sorry, d gamma l of t over dt is equal to uh, 
mm, I think there's a H bar perhaps, or they cancel out too. Probably something. I may, maybe there's a factor I'm missing here, but it will look something like that. Okay, and then your gamma L as a result will become an integral of dt i times dt of this, but now around a closed loop. So, so it will become just like that. From here, you can do it one step. The other terms can either cancel or, or you know, cancel with the right side here. So I'll go away. No. So that's, that's uh, uh, really the uh, derivation and, and uh, the time is related to this vector we, that we are moving around with it, so you can write it in terms of the parameter instead of the time now. That's the most general derivation of the of the Berry phase for quantum in, in quantum mechanics. Right? So of course, it can be zero, but for many cases, it it, it need not be zero. You know, so. And uh, uh, there are actually a couple of other steps that, uh, uh, you know, so, so okay, so here's instead instead of the parameter r, we can write it in k space, and there's, here's your uh, the very phase uh, that came straight from the Schrodinger equation. You know, there's uh, we, we, and and uh, uh, based on this and a few more steps, which I'm not doing now, but I've already told you that there's a very, you know, clear connection, Stokes-like connection between the, you know, this very uh, vector potential and the very curvature, right, and the flux. So from there, uh, it needs a few more steps, which I, you know. Um, I'm not trying to derive that you can, if you know the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions, you can find the Berry curvature, you know, uh, in, at all points in the k space now. Right? So, so that's that's the key point here. Okay, moving a little, uh, moving a little fast here, but uh, hopefully, you know, I'm just, I just wanted to emphasize that it, there's no fancy mathematics involved. You just kind of look for a phase and you find it. You know, that that's all there is to it, really. And so, so and and then there's uh, nothing more fancy than that, and it's related to the wave functions in this way. Okay, so uh, what we now say is, uh, so what has all this got to do with the quantum Hall effect, right? And uh, what we are writing here is, is the curvature uh, is related to the eigenvalues and the eigenfunctions or eigenstates of the system in, a, in this fashion. There's a en minus en prime squared and the eigenfunctions in the numerator. Okay? So uh, if I now try to calculate my you know, velocity or the velocity of an electron uh, earlier, uh, again, we, uh, this is uh, almost a repeat of what I'm saying. We have, if I had not considered the Berry phase, my velocity was just one over h bar, you know, gradient in the case space of the energy eigenvalues, right? But the moment you include this possibility of the existence of a Berry curvature and a Berry phase, you know, uh, again, in you know, a couple of steps that's, that are done in the book, you get a relation where you g still get the original form, form, but you also get this extra term now. You know, the term that was missing earlier, right? And that's purely because of the Berry phase now, or the Berry curvature, okay? And, and the Berry curvature term is, is uh, if, you're elect if the charge is uh, Q, then you get Q over H bar times an electric field cross product with the Berry curvature. You know? right. so, so this is the extra term here that you get. It's written as, okay, so it should be the other way around. E cross that, okay? E cross the very curvature is the term. Uh, don't worry about the current at this point, but just the velocity accumulates this extra term here, right? The velocity of uh, any k state in this parameter space has this extra term. And now, uh, the, uh, by the way, is this clear how, how the velocity, uh, how do I evaluate velocity from wave functions? You know, so, so it's uh, you know kind of the rate of change of the um, x coordinate or the space coordinate, and uh, uh, and 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 from there you can. You know, it needs a little bit of work to show this, right? But in in in, in the same in the same picture, if you include the Berry phase, you also get this term. That's all I'm trying to emphasize at this point. And so the moment I have this, uh, and I look at my uh, situation of a 2D electron gas, where the 2D electron gas has uh, now been experiencing a very large magnetic field, okay? and your initial density of states looked something like that, okay? of a 2D electron gas in G of E as a function of energy. right? But uh, because of the magnetic field now, you have formed these you know, discrete 
set of Landau levels separated by h bar times omega c. Okay. And now let's say my Fermi level, so these are allowed states, allowed states, nothing in between, nothing in between, and so on, the gaps in between. And let's say my Fermi level, you know, it depends on the, how much electrons I have in the system and the magnetic field, but it's, it's here, let's say the Fermi level is there. Now uh, uh, we go back to our you know, fundamental definitions of you know, quantum mechanical current. And the quantum mechanical current we have already, uh, always written as J, right, is uh, Q times spin and valley degeneracies and et cetera, right? Divide uh, by, you know, if you are in L dimen dimensions and all that. And you're summing over the velocity of state K, occupation function of state K, right? This is our most general form of, I'm uh, oh, sorry, occupation, right, of, of current, quantum mechanical current, current density. Right? Okay, this is how we began the course too. We have evaluated ballistic transistors, short key die, all, all that sort of thing, transport, Boltzmann transport, all that stuff using this, right? And now all we're saying is this velocity has this extra term, right? and, and one extra term, right? So, so let's write it that way. Uh, now I have one over h bar, you know, gradient of k, e of k, plus electron charge over Planck's constant, electric field cross product with the Berry curvature. Right? And uh, we're going to sum over all k times f of k now, occupation. That, that's the major change now. Right? And now you can see that if I have a closed uh, band, or, or, or in other words, a completely filled band, a completely filled band, uh, this sum, obviously, you know that also, you know, it goes into an integral in k space over 2 pi over L to the power d, right? But that's the expression now to calculate the current in any direction, right? Now, if I have a closed band, right? Uh, sorry, closed as in, uh, if I have my Fermi level is in the between two bands, right? All the bands underneath, below that are completely filled, right? And for a completely filled band, what, what happens to this state, right? this term, when I sum it overall? Right? It becomes zero, right? because they're equal and opposite going states. And the right going has a, a exactly equal uh, left going state. Right? So this, for a filled band, let's call it a filled band, uh, or rather insulating state, if you might. Right? Uh, EF is between in a gap. Does that make sense? The Fermi level is in a gap, right? Below that, all states are, all bands are filled. Above that, all are empty. So, if uh, if that is so, then uh, the the sum now is 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 that you have two terms. One is because of that. The second is because of that. But the term because of that is zero, because you have a lot of current, but they're all opposing each other, right? Going against each other, and so all that you are left with is that, that term now, right? So now your current becomes equal to, you know, you can pull the E out completely of this integral, okay? Uh, and then you get Q, you know, GS, GV over, so you get Q times Q, which is Q squared, right? You get a H bar, which is Planck's constant in the denominator, right? And what you get here is an integral over all K space, let's put it to the power to the D, your L to the power D also cancels, okay? And what you get is an integral of the Berry flux over the entire case space. Do you see that? Right. that that's all you get, e, sorry, e cross this whole thing. Right? Now, let's remove that and look at this quantity now. Integral of the Berry flux around a closed torus because it's in 2D electron gas. This is a torus, right? We talked about that, you know, kx and ky. So in 2D systems, it doesn't have to be here, but uh, uh, for 2D, this is clearly a torus, right? And we already saw that there is no option for it other than it to be. This is, you know, it has to be uh, exactly uh, an integer. We already have discussed that earlier. This is the churn number, right? Does that make sense? So we discussed earlier that this must be, so you can pull out a 2 pi from here if you might, but essentially this quantity here is exactly what we have defined as the churn number. We have argued earlier why if I have a very flux and I take a sum of all, all, all around a whole loop, 
you know, this quantity uh, must be, you know, q, our q times uh, what we discussed earlier here. Sorry, you know, this this quantity here. Right. So it's it's a it's a count of how many, you know. Uh, if you think of the wave functions, what happened is you know these wave functions had certain you know structure in k space. You apply a magnetic field, and you make them go in orbits now, right? And so the wave functions kind of you can imagine it. I don't know how good is this analogy. They are starting to twirl around in, in circles, if you might, in k space too, right? So it forms a vortices now, right? But then the very remarkable thing is, if the Fermi level is inside two two bands, then uh, because of this quantity, you know this. Uh, by the way, so uh, this is E cross. So if you have a current going in the x direction, the j will be in the y direction. Do you see that e cross? So so j y will be equal to e x times that, or in other words, j y over e x is what you call as the transverse conductivity sigma x y, okay? and that will be equal to that. And you can pull out a two pi from here. You know all that stuff. G s g v. You can take it to be twos and all that, and it will become q square by h times an integer. You know here. And that's your integer quantum Hall effect. That's the reason. And the reason for you know precise quantization is related to exactly what we discussed early part of the class today, which is you know the, we discussed the discrete version, but this is the quant uh, this is the continuous version of it. Okay, so, and this connection was really made uh, by uh, in only 1983 by Dave Thales and others. Uh, uh, they were awarded the last year's Nobel Prize uh, for you know uh, this and a few other things that they do. But but this is a uh, actually 82, and they don't refer to this as the Berry phase because Berry's paper came in 1984, so they had kind of anticipated that there must be something like this uh, b before the actual result came out. Okay, okay so I, I think there was a question. Uh, that, yeah. I just wanted to ask for we dropped the Fermi function just because we assumed that good point. Either one or Exactly right. So the Fermi function is one till here, and then it's zero outside, right? So if it's zero, there's nothing to talk about, right? But uh, for all all values which are one, the first term is zero, but the second term is always an integer, right? and you can have a churn number for this band, for this band, for this band, and so on. And when the sum, it's still an integer. Right? Sum of integers still an integer, and that's right. okay. Good. So I think I'm a little over time today, so I didn't get to. Uh, the, these two terms, so maybe that's a good topic for Thursday then. Okay? But uh, we covered these quantities at least. But now uh, we can go through and, and look at quite a bit of other phenomena which are all related to this idea that you know you have this extra curvature that was left out. Okay, okay, good. A uh, few things. Uh, I, um, uh, your, if you are okay, uh, I can uh, post. Uh, so I, I, I prepared the solutions for the assignments, and I would like to post them. But I've also used some of your solutions, uh, some of yours, not you know, no, no. So if if you are worried that you don't want it to be posted uh, and to others to see, please let me know so that I, I don't do that. And I just want, you know, I hope it's okay with you if I post. Okay. And uh, I'm going to send out uh, an email for uh, polling you which date would be a good date for the final presentations, and uh, uh, you know, we have to set aside some time for the final presentations. As well. Okay, good. Uh, and I had, uh, please collect your assignments if you have them. Oh, we didn't get it.